Okay, everyone. That is 11 a.m. and we are ready to go. So if you tuned in five minutes early, like um, like I always try and do to make sure everybody can get connected and so that I can make sure that my connection is good to go, um, I decided I would make a quick landscape in five minutes. It doesn't have to be detailed. It doesn't have to be uh, really thought out. Sometimes you can just try and draw whatever comes into your head. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I wanted to challenge myself to, um, to kind of set up our scene today or our stage today for, for making um, and acknowledge that it doesn't always have to be perfect, but sometimes um, fast and easy doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it can't be good. Um, and then other times we have to spend a lot of times before we're satisfied with something, but when we're just playing around, sometimes fast and loose and easy can be a really wonderful thing. Okay, so uh, welcome to Art Starts Explores. We, uh, we, our theme this week is landscapes. The voice that you're hearing right now is Kay Slater. I am the preparator and uh, gallery coordinator at Art Starts. Um, I have been working with the Outsource program for more than three years now, and I'm really proud to bring you this digital series online that you can tune into. Um, joining us in our chat comment section this week is Lily Cryan, our uh, program uh, coordinator, and she will be available for any kind of comments. Um, or sharing of what you're making at home because uh, while my rig or my camera is set up up high um, and I'm focused on making and, and uh, telling you certain things that we can try as we go along, I can't see the comments. But Lily is here and uh, she can respond to any of your questions um, and we would both love to see um, any of your comments or what you're making at home. Um, so just share that in the comment section below. Um, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you've been here before, you know what comes next. I always like to start our session with the uh, rules of explorers. And we have three of them, three rules of explorers. I'm gonna move my landscape over here for a second. So the three rules of explorers, first is respect. So we practice respect by uh, respecting ourselves, by checking in with ourselves, um, by checking in with each other, uh, asking each other how we're feeling, asking each other how we're doing. Um, and uh, some days we come to the making table a little bit more ready to explore and to share. And other days it's, it's harder. Sometimes we, we want to explore, but the creativity isn't flowing or we want to um, we want to work with somebody, but they're not in the mind's uh, space to be able to work, and so we just want to respect where everybody is when we start making. We also want to respect our tools. I have lots of tools out today that we can try, um, but sometimes when we are exploring, we'll use a tool in a way that we don't expect, and so when we do that, we um, we want to make sure that we clean the tool afterwards. We put it away properly. Um, if we're using it in a way um, that is less safe, we want to make sure that we have somebody there watching us. Maybe we have an adult uh, do that for us. Um, and that we also share our tools, right? We respect each other by sharing our tools. And then finally, we want to, and finally, and, and probably most importantly, is our respect for the land. So I'm coming to you today live from the uh, stolen Coast Salish territory, specifically of the Musqueam, Slohomish, and um, Tsleil-Waututh people. And um, I always try to make time, but also acknowledge that I am a uninvited guest on these lands. Um, and I want to be as respectful as I can while I'm practicing and making and encouraging you to make along with me. The second rule of explorers is that nothing is for keeps. And this is particularly fun when we're exploring um, landscapes because I'm always encouraging everybody to go into their recycle bins to go and grab whatever the materials they can find um, and, and bring, it on, bring it on into the practice. So, um, Today, when you are practicing these things and you're trying these things out, I really recommend that you go to your recycling bin and you figure out what's going on or um, what, what you have available to use there. Because 
you'll be surprised at the wealth of things that you can find um, when you go into uh, when you go into your cycling bin, whether that's paper, whether that's uh, plastic containers that you can um, use as materials to mix paint, um, or whether that's uh, clear plastic that you, or just different materials that you could try making on. There's so many different things that you can be trying when, you, um, when you're using things from the recycling bin because you don't have to worry about it being perfect. Then the last rule of Explorers is that we have no expectations. There are no expectations um, when we are making together because we're just trying things out, which means that all ideas are good ideas. And so when we practice surprise together, um, it allows us to really not have a picture in our head before we start making. And so what that means is, is that you don't have to be worried if something doesn't uh, doesn't go the way that you want it to. Um, you don't have to have a picture in your brain before uh, you start. And that means that if uh, as things are going, they don't turn out exactly the way you want. Um, it, it, it doesn't affect how, um, how the end result makes you feel. You can really just be fluid um, with, uh, with your making today. So we always like to try and keep these three things um, in mind when we are practicing um, explorers. So we're going to keep it loose, we're going to keep it easy today as we try and explore landscapes together. Okay, so I'm going to move these three things to the side. They're a part of what we're making, but we'll just put them off to the side so we can focus on our main area. And I can move this aside because it is after 11 o'clock, we have started. Okay, so this week, what, um, while we explore landscapes, I wanted to first look at the word landscape. And you may have heard it, especially if you have um, a phone or you've taken pictures before. Um, and I wanted to bring up here, I'm gonna get a sticky and I'm gonna write down the word orientation. Orientation. Okay, and so this this has to do with the um, the way that you frame the piece. So whether or not you have it so that the longer or um, the wider length of your picture is on the side versus where your longer length is at the top and the bottom. And so they call this orientation, they, we, we call this orientation portrait. And we call this orientation land, oops, landscape. Yeah, I'm gonna write that again so it's clear. Landscape, skip the S there. Okay, so there's our word again, landscape. And what they basically mean when, they, when they're talking about this orientation is that, um, think about a landscape. And if you don't know what a landscape is, here, I'll, I'll step back a little bit. A landscape is basically everything that is included when you look at uh, an area. It's all the things you can see in an area of land. So the landforms, so that's maybe the triangles in mountains off the side, uh, if you can see those on your horizon. Um, trees and the shapes they make, maybe silhouettes of things that you can't quite see in the distance. So land shapes, the or landforms, the land itself, um, and how the objects in that area that you can see integrate with nature or man-made features. So if you were looking at your backyard, for example, you might be able to list off a whole bunch of things that are natural or that have to do with nature, but maybe you have a swing set or maybe you have a garden plot. And those we refer to as uh, man-made or human-made features in a landscape. So a landscape is basically you open your eyes and you can see an area of land, that is a landscape. And so they use that word landscape to also describe this orientation of a picture. Because when we're looking out at the land, typically we're looking, uh, we're looking left to right and kind of a big panoramic view. And let's use mountains, for example. 
mountain ranges tend to be kind of long and wide, right? And let's here, let's put a sunset in there right there. It makes more sense to have a landscape captured this way, because if you think about the earth, right? How we're on the earth here, there's lots, and you can take pictures of the sky, sure, you can do um, a cloudscape with lots of clouds as well, but generally you can fit more information into a landscape when you have the orientation where it's long on the top and the bottom. Why do you think they call it a portrait when the long or the, 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 the wider section of a picture is like this? Think about your body for a second. So if we were laying down, right, on a bed or on the floor, then maybe it would make sense for us to take a picture of ourselves in a landscape mode. But typically, if we're going to take a picture of a person, even if we're only using their head and shoulders, because we stand upright and because we have more length, even if we're short, and that's fine, um, there, there's more of us that can be captured in a picture where the rectangle is facing this way. So even if I were going to put a head and shoulders right here, and now I've got a portrait of this uh, figure that I did here, they fit better in this orientation, then they'd probably be cropped, right? Their head is up here and their shoulders are down here if we tried to fit them into a landscape. So that's just looking at the word landscape and what it means in more um, modern usage when we're using our cameras or even our phones to take a picture, right? Somebody will say, um, hold it in landscape or hold it in portrait. The video that you're watching right now, I'm recording in landscape so that you can see the top of the screen, right, is wider and then the side of the screen is shorter. Whereas if I wanted to, I wanted to cut off all of this area over here and only show you here and longer this way, I would then shoot my video in portrait but I didn't, I shot it in landscape orientation. So that's just one way we can look at the word landscape. Before when I was talking about landscape as um, land or earth or things that you can see outside, um, the act of using landscape when we are doing art exploration has, uh, has a really long history all around the world. Um, you can find just beautiful landscape uh, paintings from from all around the world and if you were interested in just writing a uh, landscape painting um, into your search browser you would find uh, historical pieces beautiful ink works from uh, China Japan actually all all of Asia Russia there's beautiful landscapes um, usually in um, inks India as well uh, a lot of just beautiful use of, of inks and then you'll be able to also find modern watercolors um, from the Western art world, both from 100 years ago, but also probably posted yesterday. Because we, ha we humans have been living on the land, right? We, it's very easy for us to go outside and go, well, what am I gonna paint today? I'm gonna paint everything that I see. I'm gonna paint the land. I'm gonna paint a landscape. And in Western art, it was actually very interesting because once upon a time, that wasn't considered to be uh, the best kind of painting, that wasn't uh, the best kind of subject. They wanted us to paint uh, people, right? If you were going to paint, if you were gonna use ink, if you were gonna use your materials, they wanted us to use, uh, or they wanted us to capture people's faces um, and use those expensive paints because as far as a lot of those people who were paying for those paintings were concerned, the land was always going to be there. So why would you paint the landscape? And that's a really good question. Ask yourself, if you wanted to start making a picture right now um, and explore landscape, why would we? Why would we uh, use the land? If, the, if our backyard, we're, we're hoping our backyard's always going to be there, why would we take a picture of it? Why would we draw it? Why would we paint it? and ask yourself that. For me, I like to explore landscape because I acknowledge that even though the land has been here um, for a very, very, very long time, um, that when humans interact with the land, we ultimately change it. 
there's no place on the planet right now, really, that has never been touched, that has never been used, that has never been um, changed by humans or by civilization, by culture, by humans coming together and then using the land for their own purposes rather than the land just existing by itself. So when we, when we draw these things, we have the opportunity to think beyond just the tree that we see. We can think about maybe all of the animals that lived in there. We can think of the life of the tree. It didn't always look like this. And if you were to do your backyard and paint the tree in your backyard every year, you might not see the change. But after 10 years, if you compared that first painting that you did or that first picture that you drew to the one that you did 10 years later, then it might look really different. Also, just looking at the landscape as you move around, maybe you haven't lived in one place for 10 years. Maybe you move all the time. Maybe you have been in a bunch of different foster care. Maybe your school keeps changing. Um, maybe right now you're living somewhere that you haven't ever lived before. And now you can go outside and you can go and look at the land around you and notice all of these features and see if you can capture them um, by drawing or painting or putting them into um, a landscape piece of work. When we're looking at landscape though, there's, there's so many questions that we can just ask by looking at one object. So pick one object in your backyard or the park that you go to all the time, or even just go to a window and look out and see what you can see and just pick an object. I'm gonna pick, for example, a tree. And the thing about saying a tree is that you probably had a picture in your head right away when I said tree. Maybe it looked, oh, this ends up being a really light crayon. I hope that's, I hope you're able to see that. Maybe I have a darker, a darker crayon. I'll bring that up a little higher. Is that easier? No, a little bit easier. Basically, I've just put a bunch of triangles and it looks very much like uh, a kind of Christmas tree that you would see on a, on a Christmas card or um, in a cartoon. And basically just looks like three triangles that are sitting on top of each other. And then, do I have a brown crayon here? Okay, I'm gonna look at my big bag of crayons, fill out a few more. And you don't have to be using crayons right now. While you're drawing your picture of the tree that you had in your head, you might have, uh, you might be using pencil crayons. You might be using paint. Uh, you might be using just pencils or uh, markers and all of that's fine. Okay, that's a burnt sienna. That's almost, that's almost brown. So I'll use this one right now. So I'm gonna do the trunk down here. And there we go. So I have drawn a tree. And that was just from my brain, right? I wasn't looking outside at anything. That was just a tree. If you would ask me to draw a tree, that's a tree I thought of. But what's really cool about this is that I have lived on the west coast of Turtle Island and Canada for most of my life. So this kind of tree, the uh, coniferous, tree, coniferous tree, where they have pine cones in the, the pine needle trees, right? These are everywhere. I see these all the time. And so this is a tree that is very familiar to me. But I also lived um, on the lands of Treaty 13 um, in Toronto for a couple of years. And I know that they don't actually have as many of these trees. There are more deciduous trees. And so maybe if I lived more on the east coast of uh, Turtle Island and Canada, that maybe my trees would look like this. So maybe that's how I think of when I think of a tree. But maybe I'm only thinking about my tree like that because it's summer right now. And summer means that there are leaves on the tree that are green. If we were doing this workshop in the fall, that tree might not look like that. That tree might end up looking more like this with red leaves and some green leaves and yellow leaves, and then maybe the leaves are falling off the side of the tree. 
So without even going outside yet, I've just thought of three different kinds of trees from three, from three different times of the year, or two different times of the year, summer and fall. And this was something that I thought of while I was on the West Coast. And this is what I thought of while I was on the East Coast. And this was the summer and this was the fall. So going out and doing even your backyard at different times of the year, what do you notice? Is the grass the same color? Is the grass the same length? What's growing in the grass? If you get really, really, really close to the grass and just try drawing the grass, what do you notice about looking at the grass really, really close? And when you stand really, really, really far back and look at all the grass, when you go to the park, maybe you want to take your viewfinder with you and go around the park and see what you notice when you're just looking in the square of your, your viewfinder. If this is your first week uh, with us, um, maybe you don't know what a viewfinder is, but if you've been with us before, you know I really love my viewfinders. I like to bring them up whenever I can. And this is just a piece of cardboard that we have cut a rectangle into, which basically makes a frame, which makes it easy for us to look through. And so when we are going to a landscape, when we're going to an area, when we're going to our backyard or park or schoolyard or grandma's house, wherever we're going, we can then look through the rectangle and really focus on what we see through there. So try bringing your rectangle, your viewfinder, right up to the grass and look at it real close and then look at it really far and see if you can draw both of them. How is it different when you look really far away and when you look really close? When you're looking at a tree, if you're doing it in the summertime and you just take a part of the tree and you just look through your viewfinder for one part of the tree and then you come back in three months and do it again, how does it look different? So doing landscape um, artwork and going out and really looking at the land allows you to uh, really take the time to look and pay attention to how the world is changing around you. And there are artists that, um, that go outside and, um, and do this regularly and they call uh, the painting act that they do something called plein d'air and I'm going to write it down again. So this is another French word. If you were with us for collage, you learned the French word collage, um, and then you learned assemblage, which are both French words. And then this week for landscape, the French word or French words is plein de. And basically what this means is, is lots of air. So here, I'm gonna write this down underneath. Lots of air, which basically means outside. So what they'll do is they'll take their, uh, their easel and they'll go outside. They don't have to go to a window, although you can go to a window to do this, but they actually take their painting or their crayons or any of their art making tools and they go outside. And um, some art stars will sell like these little easels that you'll see that are really lightweight so people can just pick them up and have all their paintings inside. But you don't need an easel. You could take a clipboard or you could take um, a, a piece of cardboard that's really, that's really sturdy. You could take a book if you have permission that's a hard copy and then have your um, picture on top of it. If you have a piece of wood that you have permission to use, you could do that and then you could tape a piece of paper to it and then you could take it outside. And then you can be painting outside or drawing your picture outside. Um, but before you even take out any of your art making tools, I really do recommend you take the simplest art tool your viewfinder and just go looking through it. See what you can find. Maybe you'll find something really, really interesting in your garden or your park that you hadn't ever noticed before. Then you can go and bring your paper or your easel or your art making tools and go check out the, uh, uh, see if you can make um, that picture that you can see through your viewfinder. Great tool, right? So I really do love my viewfinder. Okay, so this is just one one example, but if we were looking outside at a bunch of different trees, maybe this, this is what the picture was in your head, but when you look at the tree um, with your eyes in, in public, may, or in the, the park, in the outside, in plein d'air, it doesn't actually end up looking like that. You might find that the tree ends up having uh, a really big base, so maybe triangle makes more sense. 
right? And these are just simple shapes. This is a really uh, great way of just looking for shapes in your backyard. How many shapes can you find in your park? How many shapes can you find um, on the schoolyard? How many shapes can you find compared to what you can see outside of the bedroom where you sleep? Um, but what's different when you go over to your daycare or when you go over to your cousin's house? What's different when you look out the window? So maybe that's one way. You know, where, where was my brown again? Um, yeah, I'm going to use gold this time. That's kind of a brown. Oh, it's lighter this time. Oh, but I like it. Okay, so maybe that's more what you see. You see a bunch of triangles, but they look more like one triangle. But maybe it's been really dry and while it looked like that one year, Maybe this year it's more sloped. Actually, I really like that green. Where did I put it down? Uh, I'm gonna move those over. I've lost my dark green. Can you see where my dark green is? Oh, it's right there. Yes. Okay, so maybe what happened was it grew up really tall and got really skinny. And maybe there was a section down at the bottom where um, the dog got into it and uh, bent some of the branches or uh, maybe there was a fire, maybe, maybe before you moved in, and one side of the tree has always been kind of orange and brown. It could be a fire, it could be that the tree didn't have a lot of uh, water, but maybe it's got um, a different color in it, right? So just by looking at trees, I haven't, I haven't looked at any other kinds of landscapes right now, I'm just looking at trees, I've got five different ways that I could draw a tree. How many different ways can you draw a tree? If you've just got one tree in your backyard. How many different ways could you draw it if you just use shapes? If you used crayons, if you used pencil crayons, if you tried to draw the same tree using different materials. And that's one of the things that we are going to practice today called equivalence. Equivalence, here I'm gonna write that down again. I'm using these big words and I would like I would like you to be able to see them. So e equivalence. And you know what? I don't know if I spelled that right. It might be an E. I'll check that again. And oh it might yeah, I think it might be an E. I'm gonna write that down again. And that's okay. We're just trying things together. Equivalence. I think that's right. I'll make sure, and we'll make sure that we put it in the comments, but um, I know it's one of these two. And that's all right, we're just practicing together. I'm not perfect all the time, and I'm okay with that. So I'm pretty sure it's with an E though. So equivalents are when you take one object, and then, or one uh, picture, one way of doing it, and then you try it again multiple times. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're trying to do it better. You're just trying to do it different. And you can learn so much by doing equivalence because every time you do it, you might learn a new technique. Uh, it allows you to say things like, what will happen if I? Um, more so than if you are just trying to make one perfect thing. So see how many times you can draw a tree that you can see out in your yard and make it look different, right? Maybe Maybe if you walk really close up to the tree, it's going to look different. Maybe if you lay down in front of the tree, it's going to look different. Yeah, what happens if you put your head underneath the tree and you look up through the tree? What's the, what's the shape of the bottom of the tree going to look like? Can you draw it? Can you put it onto the page? And it's really, it's really interesting when you start looking at nature and trying to capture it in a picture. There are lots of professions, um, so jobs, that deal with the nature, the natural landscape um, and are using nature or using um, trees or plants or what have you to plan scenes. So it, in your neighborhood, you might have uh, trees outside of your apartment building or you might have uh, beds of garden, so garden beds, so plants in front of where your parents work, or 
where your cousin goes to college or wherever, you'll start to notice that you can see all these, nat these natural things even when you're not in a forest or when you're in a park, when you're in the city, when you're at school. Go and see where people have planted bushes or garden beds or trees or whatever. And then sit down for a second and ask, why? Why did they put a tree here? Because that tree probably didn't grow there naturally, especially if there's a big fence around the area. People have been there for a while, right? It probably hasn't been there longer than people have been in the area. So why did they put a tree there? And you might not be able to figure out the answer for real, but you could, you can guess. And so um, trying to ask these questions about why these things happen, you start to see these connections. Um, and the more you learn about um, geography, so the study of the land, or botany, which is the, or horticulture, which is the, the study of plants um, and how plants affect the, the health of land. Um, these are things, these, these are careers. These are things that people do for a living. This is things that they do for work. So being able to plan how water can be directed through a city or how it can be managed um, so that the local wildlife can live there safely. Um, planning, planning a park. People don't just show up and then start planting things. There are people who are paid to ha who have a lot of schooling and a lot of knowledge who plan those parks. So as you're exploring landscape and you're looking at all of these things and you're starting to ask yourself questions, if this is really interesting to you, you could go into landscape architecture um, and start studying it. And so that's one way of looking at land, um, the landscape. You could also look at landscaping. You maybe have heard somebody. So there's a difference in the word landscape and landscaping. Um, people who uh, have come to your yard and maybe planted a bush in front of your house. And here, if, if you live in a house or a um, apartment building, um, try putting your house or apartment building into the landscape that you're gonna do. Oh, my, <laughs> my land came up here because of the sticky. That's cool, I like it. So maybe there's a slope in front of my imaginary apartment building right here. But for yours, Take a look at your building or wherever you're living or staying or being babysat, um, wherever you're going to school, take a look at the building, the school, the apartment, and then look at all the nature around it. Is there a reason, do you think, that they put things in different places? Because it's probable that the, at the same time that the building was made, that the things that you find around the yard were built at the same time. And when you're doing it, you can also add things like um, clouds if you want. Because um, the scenery, the things that you can see around that maybe weren't added in are also really interesting. And maybe were taken into consideration when people were uh, planning it, right? Maybe they didn't want the building to be uh, really wide so that you could see all the beautiful land uh, behind it. Maybe. Uh, the mountains over here, right? But then as you're adding things in, maybe at your front door, you're gonna put the front door right here. Maybe there's a big bush right at the entrance here. And what do you notice about that big bush at the front door? Or maybe there is a tree that's lining all along the sidewalk leading up to where you're living right now. Do the trees look the same? What's the easiest way to show the trees that you can see? And if you're drawing them quickly like me, do they even look like that? Maybe one of the trees has red leaves. See how I'm just drawing on top of it? That's okay, because I'm just doing a quick sketch, right? So maybe this bush here wasn't actually brown. Maybe this bush was green. And so I'm using an imaginary scene in my head, but you have the opportunity to actually draw what you see in front of your house or wherever you're living. You could also try and remember. So before you go outside and draw your landscape, can you try and draw your house or your apartment building or wherever you're living and then go outside and see what you got right from your memory? 
You might have always thought that there were three windows at the front of the building, and there were actually four. Or maybe you remembered there being balconies in front of all of these, but it's actually balconies on the side of the building. And I'm just going to use the lines like that to show the balcony. Right? So sometimes our memory remembers things, and it's a, and it's a good practice to go outside and actually check to see um, what's around you, what the things that we take for granted. Okay, so that's one way of doing a landscape. You can go out and you can check out how people, how your neighborhood, the people who are living there right now, have changed the landscape or how the landscape was changed around the building that was added. But then that we can take it a little bit further. And this is here, my equivalent right now. Roof my, I'm not sure if I spelled the word right over here, but I will check later. So I'm going to, I'm gonna do two things at the same time here. I'm gonna take a piece of paper. And if you already drew your imaginary uh, picture, before you go outside, if you wanna follow along, that's cool. If you went outside and you drew a picture of what you actually saw, now you can do this step. Um, as well, which is uh, an equivalent. Yeah, I'm going to move some stuff out of the way because I want to make sure everything is, you're able to see it on my screen. There we go. And I'm going to add some water to this picture, so I'm going to use some tape to tape this one down. And I'm not going to be too careful about it because remember, we're just practicing. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is just to stick it on my page or on my, um, my cutting mat here but you don't have to do that, especially if you don't have any tape or you're not using a cutting mat or if you're using a surface um, that is not yours. If it's a coffee table or you're at a dining table or you're at school public table, you'll probably want to get permission before you tape anything down. But this is my mat, so that's what I'm going to do there. So I'm going to do an equivalent. So for me, this is the picture that I have. So your picture is here of whatever you drew of your house. So I'm gonna do another, whoops, I'm gonna do another one right here. But for this one, and I'm gonna do another one right here, but I need to change my, I need to change the orientation on my canvas here, there. So now it's landscape, right? So I'm going to try and repeat what I did here using different materials for each one so that I can see the different ways that I can make each of these shapes. So I'm gonna turn off my voice right now and you can follow along by just watching me as I make these equivalents or you can take this time to try and um, to, you know, you can check in and watch what I'm doing every once in a while, but try and make your picture all over again but using something different. So if you started with crayon, try using pencil crayon. If you use pencil crayon, try using pencil. If you have access to uh, paint or to watercolors or to ink um, and you've got a nice clean setup that uh, isn't going to be too messy, then set that up and let's see what's going to happen. Okay, I'm gonna turn my voice off and let's see what we can make.
How's it going? How are the things that you're making? What are the different things that you've tried? You can see here I used some pastels, but now I'm adding some water to it, trying something a little bit different. Asking myself, what will happen if? What will happen if I had some water? I'm going pretty fast here, right? Just trying to come up with some equivalents. What will happen if I tried using uh, water with chalk pastels here? versus um, some ink, versus crayons, or pencil crayons, or pencils. And come back to this painting over here again. So keep going. We're going to do this for maybe another minute, and then I'll turn my voice back on. You can keep painting or drawing or however you want to keep doing your equivalents. I'm going to put my voice back on again and just look at what I did here. There's my original drawing. And then I do it here with a really fat brush, right? A really thick brush where I couldn't actually do many details and I wanted to go really quick. And I just put um, a little bit of, um, I, I used India ink, which is this really great black ink that you can uh, find in art stores. But you can also go to um, a lot of um, shops, especially dollar stores, but sometimes shops that you'll find in Chinatown or in Chinese neighborhoods um, or Japantown. Or if you went to Richmond, I know that a lot of shops in the malls um, that carry art supplies will usually have a really inexpensive um, bottle of, and they just call it Chinese black ink. Um, but there's lots and lots of different kinds. But if you're just practicing at the beginning, you can probably get a bottle for like two bucks of, of just this really dark black ink is what I'm using. Um, but anything that you use, whether it's paint from the art store, whether it's a tempura pad, whether somebody has made you some ink tempura, um, or sorry, some uh, uh, egg tempura, whatever you decide to use is going to be great. But when we learn, um, how to use these different kind of materials. And when we do these equivalents, we can see how things are different. I could have just done uh, an, equ an equivalent of each picture using the different kinds of black inks I have. So I said I had an India ink. I could use this ink. Um, I have so many different kinds of black ink. Um, and each one I could look at afterwards and see how they're different. So not just the landscape is, being, is going to be different, the elements that are going to be in the landscape, the materials that I use are also going to change things. I also think that by changing the different kinds of materials, you can play with emotion, right? So maybe you had a certain feeling that you have when you look at your, uh, you look at your home, when you look at the place where you are currently living, um, and maybe you want to express how you're feeling about that place. I think that both of these pictures right here have a different feeling from this one. Before I say anything, how do you think 
somebody looking at, or you're looking at these right now, do these two pictures make you feel or make you think of a different word than when you look at this picture? What's different about these two pictures that isn't in that picture? Well, when I look at pictures that don't have any color, and it is the same, right? There's still the, the building that's in all of them. The clouds are in all of them. The trees, the bushes, even the mountains are in the background. Harder to see in this one, but they're in all three of them. But these two have color and this one doesn't. And to me, this one feels maybe sadder or less defined, less clear. So maybe it feels more like a memory it also feels like it could be raining in this one. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because there's a lot of water in the ink, but I feel like this one looks like maybe it recently rained, or maybe it's wet outside, whereas this doesn't look like it's raining. This, this one right here makes me feel like it's a beautiful sunny day, probably in summer, because look at the color of those trees, right? Even with that purple tree right there, it's probably not fall. Maybe it's late summer. And so just by looking at these, these little details that we add, we can be telling people who are looking at our pictures all of these different things. So the season, the temperature, the time of day, how would this look if I was going to do this whole same picture again, but at nighttime? And maybe I wanted to make the trees even clearer. So maybe I want to get even closer in this picture and draw it again where the building is bigger, or maybe the building goes outside of the frame of this picture so I can just focus in on one of the trees. How does the tree look different when I'm really close up versus very far away? There's so many questions we could be asking when we're making landscapes, even just by focusing on one thing in the landscape. So if you're not sure what you want to be um, ever making when you want to feel creative when you want to make something when somebody tells you you should go outside and play and you, you're feeling kind of low energy um, and you just want to maybe draw something you can be high energy and draw I'm high energy high energy and I draw all the time but if you're not feeling super up for running playing soccer it's really hot outside you can sit down under the shade of a tree or the shade of a building even looking for shade how is it different when you draw or look at things when you're standing in the shade? What if you're standing in the sunshine and you look into the shade? What's the difference of looking in the shade through your viewfinder and not looking through your viewfinder? There's so many what ifs when you go outside because there's so many things to see. Okay, we're gonna do one more equivalent, but for this one, we're not gonna actually make it look exactly the same. This one, we're gonna use our imagination. So still using the drawing that you made of your, of your home or where you're currently staying right now. What we're gonna do is, is we're going to imagine what the land looked like before our building or house or tent or temporary housing, what it looked like before. And you might have a picture. Maybe somebody showed you a picture of what the land looked like before the building was put up. And if you've got that picture, then try and go even further back. What do you think the land looked like before that picture was taken? And if you have access to uh, people who are older, so whether that is uh, an elder or a community elder or your grandparents or somebody else's grandparents, um, and ask your friends. They might not actually call the elders in their family grandparents. They may call them opa. Um, they may call them, I can't think of other different words right now, but lots of different people have lots of different names for the people who are older in their families. So when you start asking other people that you're making with, um, you might have access, you might be able to talk to people who are older who might actually be able to tell you about what the land looked like before your building went up or before even the town showed up. There's, um, but if you don't have access, and for this workshop right now, for what we're doing right now, we're gonna just use our imaginations. There is no right or wrong answer. But let's try and remake this scene using one more different kind of material. If you don't have another kind of material or if you just want to stick with crayon or pencil or whatever you're using, that's okay too. 
But if there's another way that you could be making your picture using a whole different kind of material, then I encourage you to do that. And we're going to try and make this scene that you're using at home or the one that you're copying from me, which is totally okay. And we're going to pretend like the building isn't there. What did the land look like? Or what could it have looked like before the building was there? So I'm gonna take five more minutes to turn my voice off and make one more equivalent using my imagination of what this scene could have looked like before this building or the landscaping, the ways that um, humans would have put all these things together, what it could have looked like before this building was here. Remember, there's no wrong or right way to do this. Whatever you want to put in your scene or whatever you imagine was there before. And maybe you've gone out and you've really looked at the land. Maybe there's an old stump that's sitting beside your building. Or maybe there is um, a sign that talks about, like a, an information sign that talks about what was there before. Or maybe there's somebody who lives in your building who was part of the first people who lived um, on your land before whatever you are, uh, whatever your building looks like now. Okay, so that one looks pretty different, but can you see I traced the kind of land shape that was here, over here, for where the grass was. Maybe this is really far or a long time ago. I assumed that when they took the tree out here, what happened was with all the roots and the tree coming out that the land actually flattened a little bit. I just assumed that that's how that grass line, that horizon line would change over here because it's flatter over here. So that's what I was thinking through. When I put the tree there, it probably affected the shape of the line there. But I've still got the mountains and it's not so far a long time ago that the mountains were a different size. They were about the same size, but you can see them more. So I drew more of the mountains over here because it's not blocked by the building anymore. And the clouds, the clouds are going to change over time. And you can see for this one, while I tried to make sure that I always had three trees, or sorry, three, three trees, three clouds for each one of them, I had five clouds, one, two, three, four, five clouds in this one. I had one, two, three clouds in this one, and one, two, three clouds in this one. So the clouds are going to change, especially if we think about different times. And growing clouds can be really fun when you're starting to look at landscapes because uh, they do change all the time. So really you are taking a snapshot, you're taking a picture in time of what it looked like when you looked up at the clouds because even five minutes later when you try to look up for a reference, the clouds have probably moved on and they look different. 
so even looking at clouds as part of your landscape can be a really interesting challenge to try and go really quick while you're making the landscape. So that was the same. I imagined that there was some water that happened along here, and it was not really big water. Maybe it's just a little stream, but I imagined that there was water here, especially because if a tree used to grow here, um, it would it would be that the land would have a bit more um, access to water, and maybe it would be a bit healthier. And then I added some grass around here. So this was my this was my version of this of the of the imaginary place. Um, outside my building um, and what it looked like when humans came in with civilization changed the land they put in these trees here because they wanted it to look pretty along this path and they wanted to encourage birds um, they wanted to have this bush here maybe so that um, the bush would provide shade at the front door so it would make it cooler maybe the bush was there so that um, it uh, discouraged animals from going, um, or pet owners from taking their animals out and having a pee, right? There's so many different reasons that when somebody is planning the landscape that they do these things. And when you start asking yourself, hmm, I wonder why somebody put a tree here or a bush here or a gate here or put grass here or put rocks here instead of grass, you start asking, why do you think they did that? And there's probably a reason for why people placed the things that they did. Versus when you go out to maybe a forest, which is more natural, but most forests even today are still cultivated, are still changed, are still um, human made or maintained. So they're not 100% just left to do whatever they're going to do. So even nature, has human hands touching it. Um, but if we try and think back to ooh, so far before maybe even humans were in an area or maybe the indigenous nations who were the stewards and the guardians of, of this land and still maybe are, this is an imaginary place right now. So I'm going to imagine that this is um, on Coast Salish land. So um, the Musqueam, Slavitooth, and Squamish people um, were, were here, they were interacting with the land, but they didn't change anything here. So they are part of my thinking about this land when I think about the past. But maybe they didn't have a direct impact. Maybe they didn't touch any of this land other than move through it. So there's so many different ways that we can be thinking about the land when we start to put it into a picture, when we start to capture it. Even when we start photographing the land, there's the opportunity to take a picture of a really beautiful scene, whether it's a uh, beautiful water where the light off of the, the sun reflecting off of the waves make you really happy. Maybe you're taking a picture of a bird that is, um, that is flying in the air and you can see all the beautiful things behind it. Maybe you're in downtown of a city and you are in a park and behind the park you can see lots and lots of buildings. Taking a picture or drawing a picture allows you to really look at each of those different things from that moment in time that you experienced it. And then I encourage you to go back at another time and see what's different. And that's just a few ways for us to look at landscape. So I'm gonna start wrapping up now. As usual, I'm going to leave the video running for an extra five minutes after, um, so while I clean up so that you can see that I'm cleaning up because that was part of our rules of explorers. We always wanna make sure we put everything away these drawings, I'm gonna put it back into the recycling bin. Um, maybe I'll use them another time. I think some of these I've, I already had uh, writing on the other side because I pulled them from the recycling bin, um, but they're gonna go back into the recycling bin. If you have any questions or comments or wanna share your pictures, maybe you uh, followed along and we'd love to see what you made at home in the comments. Make sure you get permission from um, a guardian or parent um, or one of the adults that you're making with before you share any of your artwork online because we want you to be safe. And next week we will be back again at Saturday at 11 o'clock and we will continue to be looking at landscapes. So I look forward to seeing you next week. You can check out this archive video for the rest of the week. So if you want to invite a friend back to come and check out what we did, um, it will be on Facebook, but it will also be posted to uh, YouTube and our website, which is artstarts.com slash explores dash online and all of our videos that we post online um, after these live sessions are captioned in English. So 
I look forward to seeing you next Saturday at 11. So from Lily and I, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.